Hi, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome. Today's topic is Thomas Jefferson, Part 2. <clears throat> we stopped last time in 1776, a very dramatic year in American history, and when our country um, established the um, Independence Day on July 4th. In, uh, in May, the, uh, the delegates, uh, the, the legislators in Virginia met uh, to, dis- to decide... Uh, uh, whether to vote for independence or not, and they all 112 delegates voted for independence. And now remember, the war had been going on in in Massachusetts uh, for about a year, and uh, they've been fighting at Lexington and Concord and Bunker Hill, and then long siege in Boston, and then in 75, and then in 1776 the British withdrew. So uh, obviously, Massachusetts had started the War of Independence. Now, Virginia became, after Massachusetts, the, the next state, or actually the first state to, 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 for its legislature to vote for a Declaration of Independence, and that happened in May of 1776. The Union Jack flag, the flag of Great Britain, was lowered in Williamsburg, the capital of Virginia, and a, the new American flag was raised. So Jefferson, after this uh, meeting in, in Virginia... He was one of the delegates who went to the Continental Congress, and, and, and he arrived in May 1776 in Philadelphia. And a committee was formed. They were still debating whether or not there would be a Declaration of Independence. The war had been going on for a year, but there had been no formal break. And there were some individuals who you know, hoped for reconciliation. At any rate, there was a committee formed to write a Declaration of Independence while the debate continued. And John Adams was, of course, very important in that debate. And uh, uh, Adams and Jefferson were on this committee with another member, and it was decided that Jefferson would write the Declaration of Independence. He spent 17 days writing it, and every day from 6 p.m. till midnight he worked on it after the Congress had adjourned for each day. And uh, Jefferson felt that actually Adams should write it, because Adams, you know, really was the, the forceful leader, the greatest leader in speaking and writing about the Declaration. But uh, Adams said this to Jefferson, quote, that, that Jefferson should write it. And he said, quote, reason first, you are a Virginian, and Virginia ought to be at the head of this business, Cause, you know, because Massachusetts had started the war, and uh, they needed uh, other states to be involved. It needed to change from Mass- a Massachusetts rebellion to a, ver- to a national war of independence. Reason second, I am obnoxious, suspected, and unpopular, you are very much otherwise. Reason third, you can write ten times better than I can. So Jefferson uh, did, did write the Declaration of Independence. And it was released to the public. On, well, it was signed by the delegates, by, by the uh, majority of the delegates in, in Philadelphia in early July 1776. And then re- released to the public on July 4th, 1776, our Independence Day. So here's a, por- a passage from the Declaration of Independence. Quote, When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bonds which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it, and to institute new government. With firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. So this was the big step. You know, he talked about their fortune. Yeah, they, they sacrificed financially and their lives. You know, many of them died. Uh, Jay Winnick, who is a f- fine historian, wrote about France during this time. Quote, It was widely assumed that inequality was a good thing, that it conformed to the hierarchical order established in nature by God himself. So this whole idea of the equality of man, that human beings should be 
should have equality before the law and equality of opportunity. This was this was a radical idea, and and like like the, Winnick was saying here, you know, the people said, oh, well, look at the animals. You know, the the lion is superior to the mouse. They're not equal, and therefore there's there's inequality in human beings. Of course, there is there are differences in terms of character and so forth and talents, but. The point here is that there should be equality of opportunity and equality before the law. And that was the whole point. So anyway, after the declaration was released to the public, church bells throughout Philadelphia rang all afternoon on July 4, 1776. So this was the break in the big, you know, the, the final, the separation with Great Britain that, that uh, to, 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 to reference Julius Caesar, we had crossed the Rubicon. And uh, there was no turning back. It was it would be ind- independence or or defeat. Uh, by September, uh, uh, Jefferson resigned from the Continental Congress because his wife uh, Patty was sick. She had ongoing health problems, this uh, illness and depression. So he returned home to Monticello. Uh, and the next three years, you know, he 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 actually did a very important work, and he could also do it uh, and but by and be close to his wife. Who was very lo- was sick and lonely and depressed. So for the next three years, Jefferson worked on developing new laws for Virginia. This was very important work because you know the British laws you know were uh, were, were not democratic. They were not based on equality, and there there was a lot of uh, a lot of injustice in them. So for example, he he Jefferson was able to get laws passed that would uh, that, that would abolish the entail laws, which prohibited the. Per- prohibited the partition of large pieces of land. And uh, primogenitor was also uh, abolished. And primogenitor inv- meant that uh, in families, the oldest son would, would inherit the entire property. And the whole purpose of these laws was to sustain aristocracy. The, the belief, you, you know, you, want, you, you might have a very wealthy family and you wanted to uh, keep the property intact. You didn't want to divide it and weaken the family. And so this was uh, basically uh, supported aristocracy, which was very much, Americans were very much against. And uh, uh, Jefferson wrote that, quote, instead of an aristocracy of wealth, of more harm and danger than benefit to society, to make an opening for the aristocracy of virtue and talent. So that's, that's a wonderful line. You know, okay, let's have aristocracy, but not based on, on being born in a family. You might be a, a complete loser, and then people, you're, and then you have power and you're being respected just because you're born in a noble family. No, if people are, if there's aristocracy, if people are superior, it's based on being good people and being being knowledgeable and having skills and being able to contribute to the world. In September of 76, Jefferson wrote this, quote, I knew that our legislation under the regal government had many vicious points which urgently required reformation, and I thought I could be of more use in forwarding the work. Another one of his uh, biggest works in life was uh, helping to create the United States as a nation of religious freedom. And during the uh, colonial era, there were laws, there was persecution of Quakers and Baptists, and Quakers and Baptists were arrested, and they, they even, by law, they faced the, the possibility of being burned at the stake and going to, going to prison. And actually, yeah, the Baptist, uh, Baptist was a growing uh, Christian denomination, and the Anglican Church, you know, which was favored by the government, it was the Church of England, didn't like it, they didn't like these Quakers. They thought, oh, everybody should be Anglican. And so actually, you could go to jail if you didn't baptize your child in the Anglican Church. So Jefferson was working to change this. You know, he was writing the laws, but of course that wasn't just that wasn't everything. He also had to get them passed by the Virginia legislature. So that was something that he, he also was working on. In 1779, uh, Jefferson introduced olive trees to North America. He uh, he was big on yeah he was remember he was a farmer so uh, plants and uh, plants for consumption for food and for for flowers. Uh, <coughs> Golly, he was very interested in in bringing over from Europe, other parts of the world, uh, plants which could could prosper in America. He did quite a bit of this actually in, in in the years to come, especially when he was in Europe. He also invented the swivel chair, you know, chair which 
can can move move which would have uh, rollers it could move from side to side wouldn't be just riveted to the floor he also invented the dumb waiter which is like a food elevator where the, very often the kitchens would be in the basement and this would allow uh, food to be brought up through through you know through this elevator to to the first floor to the dining room rather than having to carry them upstairs so he, he was quite the scientist quite the inventor as well one of his many talents Again, that same year, his wife, uh, Martha, whom he called Patty, she was very sick and depressed. And so it was, it was good that he could be there and do his, you know, do, do his work. He did, was doing a lot of reading, reading the laws and trying to rewrite the laws of Virginia. And then he could do that uh, close to, at Monticello and spent, of course, spend some time in Williamsburg working to have those laws changed. That same year, 1779, Jefferson was elected governor of Virginia. And he ser- that you could serve a maximum of three one-year terms. He only served two years, and boy, did he have trouble. He had, he had a very tough time as governor of Virginia. In fact, one of the uh, a near disaster happened. He was nearly captured by the British. And this is depicted in the book by Glenn Beck called Miracles and Massacres. The, uh, uh, by the Jack Jewetts, there was a fellow named Jack Jewett, who was kind of like Paul Revere, who was able to warn Jefferson. And so he, he was, otherwise he, he would have been caught. He would have been arrested. So this meant, as governor, he spent a lot of time in the governor's palace in, in Williamsburg. Now Jefferson argued that, uh, you know, Williamsburg is between, is, is between the York and James Rivers on, on that peninsula, actually where Yorktown is as well, very near the Chesapeake Bay. And he said, you know, this is very vulnerable. Virginia was extremely vulnerable to British attack because of these large nav- navigable rivers, the Potomac, the York, and the James, and so forth. And so he said, you know, we've got to move the uh, capital inland away because it's too vulnerable. And, and he, he also believed that there should be a more centrally located uh, a city for, for, as the capital that would, serve, that would better serve the people of Virginia because v- Williamsburg was very remote for, for most of the state. And... Um, and he also wanted to get away from the tidewater elite, these very wealthy families who lived near the ocean. So as a result of Jefferson's initiative, the capital was moved to Richmond, where it remains to this day, Richmond, Virginia. In 1780, uh, Jefferson, uh, as governor, ordered a state medal with a religious motto, uh, which, which, goes, which reads this, quote, Rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. Now, one of the, the biggest problems Jefferson had was that under the law, the, the governor of Virginia was very weak, and he couldn't do anything without approval from the governor's council, which had eight members. And uh, he didn't get much support. Actually, he, had a t- he couldn't get these guys to show up. You had to have four members of the council to, to approve any, any decision, major decisions that he made. And very often, he'd only have two guys which who would show up, and the rest, you know, would be home tending to their affairs. So he, there, he, he, his hands were tied. He needed to, you know, he needed, things needed to be done, and he, he very often he couldn't, couldn't do anything. And during his time, the British invaded Virginia, and it was, the, the state was, was devastated, and there was virtually no defense uh, of Virginia. And later on, uh, he, he, uh, Jefferson was blamed. It was a big, uh, major political crisis for him. And Patrick Henry was one of his major critics, his old friend. They became, they became, so this was a very, very hard time for Thomas Jefferson. Benedict Arnold, you know, who was the American, had been an American hero in the war and became a traitor. You know, he defected to the British. And, you know, he, just by doing that, he blackened his name. And then he really blackened it further because he led the invasion of Virginia in January of 1781. And, uh, and it, 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 this was devastating. In, in April, uh, actually, yeah, in April, his uh, Jefferson, one of his uh, five-month-old daughter died, and in May they had to, you know, they'd already moved the capital from Williamsburg to, to Richmond. Then they had to move it again to Charlottesville because the because the British were invading with virtually no with no resistance. Uh, Jefferson was unable to get uh, support to to fight the British. Now his term of office as governor, ended in June, and he decided he would not run again and, uh, for, for a third term. And, and, and actually, at the same time, the British were coming to capture him. They decided, and Benedict Arnold wanted Jefferson. 
And so this uh, Jack Jewett was an American who got word that the British were, were coming to get Jefferson. And so he rode all night. He rode a horse all night to uh, Monticello. In fact, his face got cut because of the branches that were he got cut when he was passing through some, some dense area with, you know, with overhanging branches over the road. And he arrived at, at, at Monticello, and uh, he was able to warn the legislators in, 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 in Charlottesville to get out. The British are coming, and most of them got away. A few did get arrested. And Jefferson kind of took his time, you know, but he was a, boy, he was lucky because he should have moved a little quicker. But anyway, he did make it, and then, you know, he sent his wife and children away as well, um, and well, one good thing is the, you know, the British never burned Mount Vernon. They never burned uh, uh, Monticello. So they didn't have a sense of being gentlemen. And so anyway, this was, this was pretty tough, pretty tough. The, the, the devastation of Virginia and the near capture of, of Thomas Jefferson. Now, in, in uh, September, the, the decisive battle of Yorktown was fought in Virginia. Uh, but very few Virginians were involved, actually. It was, this was really not a, a great victory, victory for, for Virginia, although it was fought in Virginia, and it helped end the war. Three-quarters of the men involved in the Yorktown victory were French, the French Navy and the Chesapeake Bay, and, and then the land forces were, were half French, half American. And, of course, this was the Continental Army under George Washington. And so after, actually, there was uh, Talk, talk of investigating. Yeah, actually, Jefferson was investigated. They thought, oh, you know, this is a scandal. You, 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 were, der, der, you, you were dereliction in, of duty. You didn't do a good job. You know, you, and, uh, so, but anyway, after Yorktown, they kind of forgot that and let it go. And they realized, you know, people realized that you know, he did his best. What, what can you do? Under the law, he was really restricted in what, how he could um, and what he could do to, 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 uh, to counter the British attack an invasion of, of Virginia. The British came into R Richmond and they uh, uh, they uh, they destroyed a lot of things. They just actually destroyed a lot of his uh, crops, and they his uh, he had another library that was destroyed in his office in in, in Richmond, and some of his slaves were taken away. Uh, so this was this was very very hard, uh, very 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 demoralizing. But shortly thereafter, Yorktown happened. So that was. That was, that was, you know, finally there was, uh, the, 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 the end of the war was in sight. The following year, 1782, Jefferson wrote a book called Notes on the State of Virginia, where he wrote about the, described the laws, customs, history, physical features, and economic conditions of Virginia. This became a famous book. It was translated into French and German and gave Jefferson scientific fame. He was famous for his, uh, for his as a scientist. In September, September 6th, 1782, his wife died. Uh, Martha, whom he called Patty, she died. They, she was only 33, and they'd been married for 10 years. She'd been pregnant uh, seven times in seven years. Now, she was uh, slight. In other words, she was kind of skinny, and she was high-strung. She tended to be kind of nervous. And uh, I think the stress of the war, especially the stress of the invasion, uh, affected her. Along with these, you know, actually these seven pregnancies, you know, she wasn't that strong physically, and the, she was always sick when she was pregnant. And then, like I said, she had depression. I'm sure, that factored into her, her into her death. And so this, and so, um, you know, Jefferson had, had been worried about her for so long for good reason because she finally she died, and uh, this is very very sad. Um, so uh, Jefferson lost his wife. They actually they had a very good marriage even despite her sickness and depression, because, you know, they had similar interests in, in literature and reading and music. So this was very, very hard on him, losing his, his, his beloved uh, Patty, Martha, also known as Patty. And so on his tombstone, he had this inscribed on Martha uh, Jefferson's tombstone, quote, Nay, even in the, in the house of Hades, the dead forget their dead. Yet will I even there be mindful of my dear comrade? So this, this was devastating, the death of Patsy Jefferson. Already, uh, of course, his, his wife died here. He'd had um, uh, two daughters and a son who died as infants. His parent, you know, his father, he died, lost his father very, very young. His mom was, had died by this time. And then uh, he described this time after uh, Patty Jefferson's death, quote, that he was in a, quote, stupor of mind, which had rendered me as dead to the world, as she whose loss occasioned it. Now his uh, his daughter, he had this uh, his eldest daughter uh, Patsy, 
who was, I believe, about 10 years old at this, well, no, about 8 years old at this time. And she described this the time during her, her mother's fatal illness. And she wrote this quote. Uh, he, and she's talking about her father, he nursed my poor mother in turn with Aunt Carr and her own mother, her own sitter, sitting up with her and administering her medicines and drink to the last. For four months that she lingered, he was never out of calling. When not at her bedside, he was writing in a small room, which opened immediately at the head of the bed. Historian uh, Willard Stern Randall wrote this, quote, Patty's death changed everything for Jefferson. Devoted to his wife and family and their home at Monticello, he was cut off at her death from his fondest pleasures. The music, the joy went out of his life. He was left not quite 40, with three children and six nieces and nephews to raise. But he would never remarry, and it would be a dozen years before he could stand there home, Monticello again. In a self-described stupor of mind, he lost all interest in their interests. Actually, before she died, she, she made him promise that he would never uh, remarry as, as she was dying because she was worried that, a, that they would, he would have, his, if he married again, that, this, that it would, the woman would be an evil stepmother and mistreat her children. And that, so he agreed, he, and he never, he never remarried her and never uh, got married again. Now, the, he did have a relationship with this, uh, we'll talk about later, a woman in, in, in Europe. And then Sally Hemings, or it's the most famous one, one of his slaves. And we, re, we really don't know if, if, if Sally Hemings became, years later, his common-law wife or not, his secret common-law wife. We, we don't know. It's possible. Uh, but um, what we do know is that they never, he never remarried. Now, the following year, he was you know, very concerned about his daughter, his old, eldest daughter, Patsy, and her. He wanted her to be well-educated. And he wrote this, quote, The chance that in marriage she will draw a blockhead, I calculate at about 14 to 1. And of course, that the education of her family will probably rest on her own ideas and directions without assistance. So actually, his, he gave his daughter, he made sure his daughter, uh, Patsy, had a, an outstanding education. He didn't, want, he didn't want her to be dependent on a husband who might be a, might be a blockhead, as he, as he wrote. In December of 1783, Jefferson was in Annapolis, Maryland, uh, uh, for the uh, ceremony in which George Washington resigned his commission, as uh, you know, and when he was going home to uh, Mount Vernon, and uh, Washington reportedly drank 13 toasts, which were pro proposed by the 13 states, and was still standing to return one of his own. I mean, it must have been tough. If you all these toasts, you have to make sure you just have a have a sip. Don't drink too much on each toast. Now, for years, the uh, Continental Congress had been trying to send Jefferson to Europe as a diplomat, uh, and he had refused, and primarily because of the health of his wife, because he, he didn't want to leave her. In fact, that's why he left Philadelphia in the Continental Congress, because of concerns for his wife, for her, for her health. But, you know, she was gone, and he actually felt kind of he really didn't want to be at Monticello because it reminded him of her, and he was, he was, he was grieving. So in 1784, he accepted the, uh, this uh, charge to go to Europe and to work as a diplomat. So he, he sailed across the Atlantic Ocean in, in a tip and uh, ended up in most, spent most of his time in Paris, France, and his job was to establish commercial treaties with European countries. Now remember, the, the war was over. The War of Independence had been won. And uh, so he, his job was to work as a diplomat for the United States. He, he brought his 11-year-old 11, 11 daughter, Patsy, with him. And then he left this 5-year-old uh, uh, daughter named Mary. They called her Polly. He left her in Virginia. And a 2-year-old, Lucy, with uh, his wife's uh, sister and husband. So he, he brought the oldest daughter with him, left these two younger ones behind. And that same year, he got eventually that the two-year-old daughter Lucy died, and you know that was this was another tragedy. He lost his, his little little girl, and he got news in, over in Paris, in, in Paris that she had died. <clears throat> the following year, 1785, Congress adopted Jefferson's proposal for a monetary system 
based on tens. Jefferson thought he believed in the decimal system. And so you'd have a dollar, and one-tenth of a dollar would be a dime, and one-tenth of a dime would be a penny. It's a very simple, effective system, which was adopted by Congress. So it was Jefferson's idea. Early on, uh, Jefferson was with John Adams and Benjamin Franklin in, in France, now, uh, Fra Ben Franklin was, was elderly and in poor health, so he, uh, he wanted to come home, and he, and he did, and he left that year. And, also, and then Adams ended up going to Great Britain as ambassador there, so that meant that you know, Thomas Jefferson was the main, he was the U.S. ambassador to France. And so he replaced, uh, there was some people said, oh, he, he was replacing Benjamin Franklin. And Jefferson responded, quote, no one can replace him. I am only his successor. So he was paying his respect, to, his respects to, to Benjamin Franklin, who had been such a, uh, you know, really famous, incredible man. Uh, before he went home, the King of France gave Benjamin Franklin a portrait of himself, surrounded surrounded by 416 diamonds. Wow! Just imagine, and uh, this just shows why the why the French Revolution happened. Things like that, you know, this type of uh, luxury and. Really, you could say a waste of resources. Uh, in that book that I mentioned, he wrote this the book, Note, Notes on the State of Virginia. Uh, there's a good, good quote. He, he talked about slavery. He wanted to abolish slavery in the United States. And he wrote this quote, Jefferson, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep forever. The most unremitting despotism on the one part and degrading submissions on the other. Yeah, one of the uh, very hard things in his life was that yeah, he, he himself owned slaves, and he saw what slavery did to everyone. He, ha he saw how it, it, it created cruelty in, in white people, in Americans, in slave owners, and he saw it in children. This really troubled him, he saw children. And he talked about the, uh, and, and, and then what did it do to the slaves? The slaves had to be so submissive and, and really, uh, you know, swallow their tongue and, and accept so much cruelty and then and become very, you know, abject and sort of pit and very pitiful, very sad. So he saw how this really, really uh, corrupted everyone. The slaves were really hurt psychologically and and the owners and the, you know, the European descent Americans who were who, who owned slaves. Uh, this this really hurt their character. And uh, so he was, he, you know, he like he said in this quote, that God is just. But this is this is wrong. This this needs to be abolished. Of course, he, he was never it wasn't abolished during his lifetime, and he himself was never able to become uh, to, to free his slaves because he, he needed them financially. He had severe financial problems, and he was unable to unable to free his own slaves. So for for four years, from 1785 to 89, Jefferson was the U.S. ambassador to France, and uh, he became good friends with the Marquis de Lafayette. Of course, who had played a major role in the American Revolution, who had become like a son to George Washington. And uh, he was also trying to promote trade with France and trying to help the U.S. Over to lessen its dependence on Great Britain and trade with Great Britain. Now, one, one thing to, to note here, we do, we do know that there were, oh, I believe, more than 12 million Africans taken into slavery from uh, from. West Africa and Central Africa, and brought to the New World, brought to uh, the Caribbean, to Brazil, and the English colonies in North America. Uh, uh, so, some, yeah, like some 12 to 15 million. But another little-known fact is that between 1530 and 1780, basically the same the same time period, one million Europeans had been kidnapped and enslaved by North African Muslim states. This would be Algeria, Morocco. Tunisia, and what's now Libya. So one million Europeans had become slaves, and they were captured on the Mediterranean by these, by these, uh, by these uh, North African ships, and you know, disappeared, never, never heard from again, and wound up ensla enslaved in North Africa and the Middle East. Um, and then, yeah, this ongoing problem with the North African countries who were they would capture they would capture ships all the time and say oh demanded ransom these pirates north basically north african but the, they were they were state sanctioned the governments were supporting it they're supporting piracy in north in north Af african countries and the european countries their solution was to was to pay to pay money 
uh, pay a certain amount of money so that their ships would be immune, would not be attacked. And the United States got involved in this. Pretty terrible. From 1786 to 1801, the U.S. had no navy, and uh, the, the U.S. paid the, what they called the Barbary States, the countries of North Africa. They paid them $2 million in tribute for 15 years at the end of the 1700s to not attack American ships. So this was an ongoing problem. So it appears we're out of time. Uh, we will continue next time with this fascinating story of the life of Thomas Jefferson, wonderful man, wonderful uh, hero in American history. Until then, to quote the, the fine people in Latin America, uh, hasta la huego, hasta la vista, vaya con Dios. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.